Hey guys, and welcome. Today we have a Macintosh Plus 1 megabyte. Well, actually we have a Macintosh SE as well, but since both need a significant amount of work, the Macintosh SE will surface in another video. Please excuse the video quality. This is a project I started quite some time ago, and I was trying a new video format that didn't work out as well as I was hoping using self-mounted GoPros. As you might be aware, the Macintosh Plus uses a somewhat proprietary clock battery behind this hatch. In some cases, such as this one, an uninitiated owner replaced the dead 4.5 volt battery with what visually appeared to be the same, a standard 1.5 volt AA cell. Without even opening it up, you can see the battery has leaked severely and has likely caused some internal damage. This Mac shows absolutely no signs of life at all, completely dead connected to power. So let's see what's going on inside. In the absence of a Mac cracker tool, I originally tried a plastic pry tool as to not damage the plastics, but found it didn't work very well. I did find this metal spudger worked really well for wiggling and walking the case apart. With some patience, it came apart with absolutely no damage. The inside of the housing was in excellent condition, showing off the molded signatures of its creators. I took a look inside, and fortunately, things didn't look so disastrous. It was pretty obvious that the CRT didn't charge up, but off camera I did go through the proper CRT discharge procedure just to be safe. Those of you who work on these know the dangers. Any of you who are new to these types of machines, it is extremely important to know that a CRT can store a very lethal amount of energy inside. It works like a large capacitor and can store a charge long after it's been unplugged. It can severely harm or even kill you. Never trust a CRT no matter how empty you think it is. Always use proper CRT discharge procedures when working on these. I removed the main logic board for inspection, disconnecting the relevant cables. To my shock and amazement, the board had sustained no damage from the leaky battery, despite damage to the chassis around it. Next, it's time to remove the analog board. Since the battery would have leaked down this board, it was probable that there was going to be some issues here. I carefully removed the flyback wire, knowing I had verified the CRT was discharged, then removed the board. The PCB had a protective insulation sheet behind it, which I carefully removed by releasing the brittle plastic clips. Many of the traces were bubbling due to corrosion behind the solder mask. It was worse than I hoped, but certainly repairable. The chassis had a significant section of corrosion, but this should clean up pretty nicely. I did remove the chassis from the housing and stripped it down, removing the floppy drive. Fortunately, it looks like the floppy drive was spared any damage. Because the corrosion was caused by an alkaline battery, I used vinegar to neutralize and help clean it up. The vinegar worked remarkably well. Since vinegar is also an acid and also corrosive, I hosed the entire thing off thoroughly in the bathtub. After cleaning, the chassis looked almost as good as new, though you can see where the protective paint or factory coating was eroded. Now back to the analog board. Peeling away the loose solder mask, there was extremely heavy oxidation behind it. I used tweezers, a pry tool for scraping, and sandpaper to clean the corrosion off the traces. The battery holder and power switch were extremely bad. I didn't know whether either would be salvageable. I wasn't too worried about the battery holder. I know most restorers would want to install a replacement battery, but I see that as a liability. You guys probably know my rule. Batteries out. Set the clock manually each time since these aren't being used daily. I searched online, but I could not find a replacement power switch that would match this form factor. I realize I could use any switch and modify it, but like I've said in previous videos, I want to keep everything as original as possible. I tried cleaning the battery contacts and the power switch contacts in place. Although I didn't have bad success with this, I wasn't getting all the corrosion off. 
And anyone who's ever done bodywork on a car knows, if you leave any corrosion behind, it will come back through no matter how nice your finished project is. I resorted to desoldering the battery contacts and fully disassembling the power switch. I soaked all the components in vinegar and cleaned them thoroughly. I carefully reassembled the power switch using copious amounts of solder. The battery holder, on the other hand, was not so successful. One of the terminals had eroded so much the metal was thin and broke. No matter how much I tried, I could not get solder to stick and hold reliably. I decided to leave the plastic battery holder for aesthetics, but I decided not to reinstall the battery terminals. Now for the easy part, replacing the reefer capacitors. I got these from DigiKey and they appeared to be the exact replacement. Nice. I spent, admittedly, more time than I should have researching about solder masks. Many of you guys are using nail polish, which research seems to agree is an adequate solution. But it just didn't make me feel right to put something inside which didn't belong. So I ordered a green UV curable solder mask. The mask went on like paint, but never fully dries without being exposed to ultraviolet light. A UV flashlight worked great for the Tandy 200 board repair, but the area on this board was far too large. Even doing it in sections, it was still tacky after hours. After about two days of messing with this, I got fed up. Doing some research, it appeared that halogen bulbs at short range without glass covering can produce a significant amount of ultraviolet. So I ended up using a 500 watt halogen work light at close range, which completed the job fully within a day or so. While this project sat on the shelf waiting for me to get back to it, it appears that rust has started to form again on the chassis. I've decided to clean it again and this time paint it so that the rust won't be able to come back through as easily. Okay, that pretty much does it for repairs. Upon visual inspection, everything appears to be good at this point. The only thing left is the yellowed housing, which is a deep brown, orangish color. As you may already know from other restorations I've done, I'm not big on retrobriting. For this machine, I tried a new method using only sunlight, which I'm totally thrilled with the results. Check out my video where I go into depth on this process. And make sure you're subscribed with the bell icon turned on so you don't miss upcoming videos. Okay, well, this was a pretty big project for me. I'm going to end the video here. At this point, we've got basically all the parts repaired and ready. The next video, part two, will jump into reassembling, testing, and any necessary troubleshooting. Thanks so much for watching. Making these videos, there is always thought that they won't be good enough, but your views, subs, likes, and kind comments are always very encouraging. I wanted to let you know they are very appreciated. Thank you. Until next time.